since the kind of theme of the day has been famous people, I thought I ought to start with uh, my experience of meeting a famous person. So I finished university, uh, worked down in Sussex as the lay chaplain to one of the bishops there. And we had a phone call one day from the producer of Ramsey's Kitchen Nightmares. And uh, basically, in the centre of Haywards Heath, there was an old restaurant called the Priory. Um, it was, in fact, historically a priory. Um, and it became a restaurant, and it was dreadful. I mean, like, you wouldn't, feed, you wouldn't take your dogs there, let alone take other human beings there. And Gordon ran, rang us and said, would you bring the bishop and a group of clergy to the priory and experience what this is like? So we went. Unlike Sharon, I would say Gordon Ramsay was horrible. <laughs> he was horrible. Not to us, he was quite pleasant, but to the kitchen staff, he was awful. But as we walked into the uh, priory, um, by the way, the, it was 2006 it was filmed, and if you want to see it, it's on, it's on shore quite a lot at the minute, on E4, right? We walked down this corridor, and we were met with the producer who said, just wait there, just wait there, just wait there. Um, go into the bar and enjoy yourselves. Bearing in mind, I walked in with a bishop in full purple cassock <laughs> and a group of clergy also wearing their cassocks. And we walked through the door and this group of 20-somethings ran over and went, Are you the stripper? <laughs> <laughs> the bishop said yes, which was really <laughs> awkward. And then I had to explain to him, no, actually, he is the bishop. Like, please don't expect him to take his clothes off. Um, we then went upstairs, waited three and a half hours for our meal, and Gordon Ramsay was a nightmare. So there you are. If you ever got to watch it, the bishop did pray for Gordon and said, um, Dear Lord, we pray for Gordon Ramsay. He really needs it. <laughs> um, so that's my experience of uh, Gordon Ramsay. Not quite the same as Sharon's, as you can tell, but there we are. Um, just before I start, I just want to say one thing. It's not really in my remit. Well, it might be in my remit, but it's not supposed to be. But I just think, before we go any further, that we really need to say a massive well done to Sarah. I'm not sure that there is a chance at the end to, for anybody to say it. But today has been an utter joy, Sarah. From the theological underpinning... Uh, from the theological underpinning at the beginning that you gave about why we're here, all the way through the speakers, it has been an utter joy. And it is a real joy to be here today to talk to you a bit about what vision we have for, for children and youth work across the diocese. And I'll, I'll get to that. But along the way, what I want to do is I want to recapture some of the things that Ruth spoke about and also to kind of point to you a little bit about what we're asking or what we're going to ask of the parishes as we engage in this process. So I'm going to start with a joke. Well, I hope you find it funny anyway. <laughs> um, after a church service on a Sunday morning, a young boy suddenly announced to his mother, Mom, I've decided to become a minister when I grow up. That's okay with us, she said. But what made you decide that? Well, said the little boy, I have to go to church every Sunday anywhere, and I figure it'll be more fun to stand up and be heard than to sit and listen. <laughs> so I've got a question. Do we believe in this diocese that our children and young ones long to be heard? Do we believe that they long to express themselves? Do we believe that they want to contribute meaningfully? How times have changed. But I would say absolutely. And at the heart of the vision for the Diocese of Blackburn is that we need to embrace that. We need to listen to them and we need to be open to the ideas that they bring along. And, and throughout the, uh, the next kind of 20 minutes or so, I'm going to try and point you as to why I think that's the case. So in our vision 2026, will you just pop that up, Ben, please? Um, well, that wasn't the bit I was hoping for, but never mind. In our vision for 2026, clearly I've missed that bit, um, it says this. Our vision is to see children and young people transforming the world through the love of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our mission is to help build worshipping, discipling and prayerful children and young people that love Jesus and want to follow him and who live out their faith 
in communities, in friendships, and in families. Wow. And the reason I say wow is because having lived now in five different dioceses, this is the first one that strategically aims at meeting young people and pointing them and giving them access to Jesus. And on the board up here is what's in our vision statement. So there is uh, four priorities, the fourth of which is inspiring children and young people. And these are the things that we hope that we nurture children and young people in their faith and support them as disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what you're doing. That we hold regular worship that is accessible and appealing to children and young people and their families. That's what you're doing. That we enable growth in numbers of leaders of children and young people. And we've started to see that coming through. That we pursue a step change in work of those aged 11 to 16, and that's Ben's job. Just yours, Ben. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that we facilitate effective partnerships between churches and local schools. And clearly, as Director of Education, that's one of the things that I feel utterly committed to. Um, I just want to give you a bit of an example, just to show, as a person, why that really matters to me. So, as head teacher, I was in a, a parish in a really deprived community, and we had two churches. The posh one that was up the road, and the poor one at the bottom of the road. And... Um, Nobody really liked coming to the poor one. We were kind of like, oh, well, it's just a church at the bottom and that's not really where anybody goes. And no one from down where we were was brave enough to go up to the top. So the connection between the community and the church was really, really poor. But the connection between the community and the school was excellent because ultimately we were there serving their children on a daily basis, giving them the education that they required, showing them Love, which is a really important part of uh, a, a really good school, and ultimately giving them that access to Jesus. And one of the things that we did was we started to think about how can we get them more involved in the church? So we set up a, a toddler group, which I know Sarah is a huge advocate of, and the toddler group was our school's toddler group with the parish. So we identified three leaders in the parish and three teachers in school who made sure that every week we gathered together in that church. And basically, to start off with, it was prayer and coffee, or prayer and coffee and toast, or prayer and coffee and whatever. Not scones as lovely as you've just had. And over time, that grew into reading the Bible, to, pray, to, be, to worshipping together. And by the time I left, there were 75 people attending that church and we had four active baptisms in the coffee morning with the whole school community there and three of the adults got confirmed one Thursday morning by the bishop. It's amazing how something so small can grow into something so big and actually those effective communities, those effective partnerships a key to how we grow. So I can't advocate enough. If you haven't already got a relationship with your church school, make one. It's worth it. They have connections that you will never have and take the opportunity to get in. So each of these statements is really, really key. And what I want to do over the next little bit is focus on inspiring children and, in, and young people. And I want to give you a flavour of the vision. So can you imagine a future where every church in Lancashire boasts an active and thriving children's ministry? Our heartfelt desire in the Board of Education and in the diocese is that every parish in every locality prioritises ministry to children and to young people. And they make their decisions based on how they can do that best. Jesus told us in Matthew 19, as I'm sure you've heard this a million times, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs 
to such as these. These profound words highlight the importance of welcoming children, emphasising their role in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' message underscores the value of ministering to children, to nurturing their faith, and to recognising their innocence and trust as qualities that are essential for entering God's kingdom. So why wouldn't we want to be part of that? Consider this. Without embracing and reaching out to this ministry, we might miss the essence of what heaven truly looks like. Today, I know I speak to a, a room filled of individuals who are already dedicated to developing children's ministry. The evident truth is that you're here and that we feel called to serve Jesus in the capacity of children's ministers and children's workers. But we are equally called to do this right and equally called to inspire others to do it as well. The work that you do, the impact that you have, extends through the word of mouth on the street. That church down the road, they've got some really good stuff going on, you know. Maybe we should do some of that. The thrill of you growing your children's ministry. They were only had five last time I went. They've got 50 this time. What's going on? And most importantly, the way in which we disciple our children and young people. In these elements, we find the potential to inspire those around us. And if we, that's the collective we, can uh, create a ripple effect that echoes that joy across the diocese, then in no time we will have churches filled with children and young people. So throughout our time together, my goal really is to share with you the hopes of the diocese for children's ministry. And I want to share with you the latest initiative, the thing that we, we have recently submitted to the National Church to see if we can continue this growth. Because ultimately, we want to enhance the wonderful work that you are already doing in your communities, all while concentrating on the main thing, on Jesus. Now, I wonder how many of you have read this book. Um, it's Stephen Cottrell's book, uh, The Archbishop of York. He wrote it when he was the Bishop of Reading, and it's called Hit the Ground Kneeling. It's a fantastic book. It's about leadership, particularly about faith leadership. Um, so it speaks to me very much in my role as Director of Education, but it should speak to you in your roles um, working with children in our, school, in our churches. Essentially, what Stephen Cottrell talks about is um, how regularly, in chapter two, he talks about how when we appoint people into role, we always want them to hit the ground running. And when you reflect on what hit the ground running looks like, it means essentially that you're going to turn up and you're going to look really busy. You're going to do loads of work, but actually you're not really having time to think about what's really going on. And what's... Uh, Bishop Stephen, Archbishop Stephen, asks us to do is to stop, to take time, to pray, to think about what is in place, to reflect, to think about what we're currently doing, to think about where we want to get to, and then to start working. So I call you as much as you possibly can particularly as you're reimagining what your work might look like, before you hit the ground running, take some time to stop and to pray and to focus. I cannot recommend that book to you enough. It takes about 25 minutes to read. In fact, at the beginning, he says, um, don't read this in one go, read it in chapters and then think about what I've said. Because actually it's a really easy read, but it does really help to give you that focus about how good leadership looks. Talking of hitting the ground kneeling, I want to talk to you about this person. Does anybody know who that is? Matt Redman. Well done. Very impressive. Matt Redman is, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the writer of lots and lots of really good Christian songs. Um, 
so when I was Bishop's chaplain, uh, there was a knock on the door and uh, opened the door and in front of me was a, a young man, this young man, with his guitar and another bloke next to him who was carrying a Bible. It wasn't unusual in a bishop's house, but it was still a bit unusual. There was no assigned appointment and the bishop wasn't even in the house. And these two people said to me, we've got an idea that we need to throw at you. So they came in and we talked for a little bit and they had this vision. They had this vision of setting up a church in the centre of a brand new housing estate in the middle of a school. And uh, we were unpicking exactly what it was that they were after. Um, Matt was like, well, I make loads of money from music, so it doesn't really matter to me. But Will, he needs a job, so he needs some stipend. Can somebody find some stipend for him? Um, and we were trying to unpick what they, they were thinking about and what they were trying to do. And they had this real passion, and you could feel the real passion, that they grew a church. A church that was focused on all ages and welcomed everybody in. So we, when we were unpicking their plan, they said to us, the first thing we want to do is nothing. I was like, I'm not paying you for nothing. Um, we did pay them for nothing. But um, the first thing they wanted to do was to stop and to pray. And for six months, as a group, four of them met every day and they prayed. Every so often there was a fifth because I had to go and check that they were actually doing what they said they were going to do. But actually, they were doing it. They were there and they were praying. After six months, they opened the doors and they said, look, um, what we want now is just a bigger group of people who want to pray. And little by little, that, con that little group grew. Grew to about 20. Um, after a year, we said to them, right, come on then. You've done, you've done what you said you were going to do. Open up the doors. Let's see what happens. On day one, they had 380 people in church. 380. And now that community is still alive. And there are 3,500 who attend that church every, every week. It is the most insane and inspirational place. And why? Because they didn't actually hit the ground running. They hit the ground kneeling. What an inspirational story. Will is still there. Matt's now making millions and millions and millions of pounds over in America as a Christian pop star. Um, there is an all, whole industry if you go to America to listen to her. Um, one day when we went, when I went to pray, he pulled out a guitar and he said, oh, I've written this new song. Bearing in mind, this is about 2006-ish. And he pulled out this guitar and he said, I've written this new song um, and I want to play it for you. Um, some of you might have heard it. It's called 10,000 Reasons. <laughs> it's just a small song. He didn't actually, um, they, di they didn't actually make the song officially until 2011. But in 2006, he played this song. And I think it really talks to us about children's ministry. I think actually the words in it really tell us about things that as children's workers, we should do. So I've asked Ben if he'll play it for us. And while he's playing, I'd love it if you join in because it's a really beautiful song. But I'm equally happy for you to just sit and reflect on the words. Because afterwards, a bit of a job for you, I want you to think about what is it that in these words it's saying to us as children's workers. That's not what, I don't mean what do you need to, do? I mean as people, what does it say we need to do as children's workers? So uh, Ben's going to play the song. And then we'll have a bit of time to reflect on that. I'll, I'll talk to you about that. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, and worship his holy name. Sing like never before. sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass 
and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul and worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name you're rich in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul and worship his holy name sing like never before oh I worship your holy name And on that day when my strength is failing The end draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy Lord, I worship your holy name. I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? Just the words are beautiful. Um, imagine sitting in a, you know, a vicarage garage, listening to the singer sing it live when there was four people in there. I mean, it was insane. Um, so just for a minute or two on your tables, look at the words... What are the things it's telling you to do in your own lives as children's workers? So what are the things? And, and uh, we'll take a couple of suggestions and then I'll tell you what I think it's telling um, us to think about. So just a, a couple of minutes. Apologies for cutting you short, but I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm already pushing my luck. Um, and I need to get a bit of a move on. Sarah's just told me off, so I'm, I know I need to move. Um, you didn't really, but... Um, so, any suggestions? Anything that people think that the song is telling them? Anything that they think that they should uh, direct themselves towards? Come on, be brave. Go on. I, 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 th I think that's really beautiful. I mean, maybe you should come and do the next bit. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, abso absolutely, absolutely. I think there is a sense through it, isn't there? Partic I mean, there's an absolute hall to that worship, and the things that you do are technically worship. Right? That's what we're, we're, we're calling you to do. Every lived act that you do, you are worshipping um, God. So, yeah, absolutely. Anything, anything else? And then I'll tell you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Putting Jesus at the centre of everything that we do um, means that the children get that. And then actually that's what they can then go on and spread that word. 100%. So these are a couple of things that, I, 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 that kind of stood out to me. Um, so in the first verse um, there, it says, uh, sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Let me be singing when the evening comes. For me, that's all about faithfulness to God. As children's workers, it's essential for us to prioritise our own faithfulness to God. 
and allocate time specifically to worship. How many of you are out of church during the main service? Lots of you. And actually, what we must intentionally do is carve out moments for prayer and to nourish our own spiritual growth. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But are we going to do it if we don't feed our own faith? How are we going to do it if we don't take those moments to grow us as people so that we can grow young people? So, let us be faithful stewards of our calling, continually seeking inspiration from the main thing, from Jesus, and committing ourselves to prayer and reflection. As we invest in our own spiritual well-being, we can clearly better serve the children and families entrusted to our care. And we can be confident that God is with us. Now, much like Archdeacon David, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't talk to you a little bit about fruitful. Um, what Archbishop, what Archbishop, I've just promoted him significantly, <laughs> but what Archdeacon David um, didn't say to you is, if you type in fruitful on your app store, what you'll get is uh, an app that teaches you how to do gymnastics. Uh, don't download that one. Well, no, hey, download that one if you want to. And um, what you need to do is type in fruitful Blackburn. And one of the reasons that I think this is really important for you guys, in particular, for all of us, is that actually this is very much about us making the space to worship. Every day on there, there is our Lent devotionals. Um, you'll even discover that, that a week ago, I did one all about being an imposter. It's absolutely, absolutely about real life people telling you real life stories that link to the Bible. Take the time. It literally takes about a minute to read. And also on there is Bishop Phillips' Lent, Devo Lent course. If you can't fit in going to the Lent course in church or your church isn't running it, you can do it yourself. It takes literally about 15 minutes to, to watch the video and to reflect on some of those things. I can't urge you enough to feed your own faith. It's so easy to be busy and actually you need to make that space. And if you hear nothing of what I say over the next kind of 20 minutes, that's the key message. Feed your faith so you can feed others' faith. Second verse, uh, you're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. In Deuteronomy 7, it says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. This scripture, along with the message of the song, directs us towards a spirit of gratitude for the abundant blessings that we get. A quality that, on the whole, children's workers are actually really good at, and perhaps the church isn't so good at. The song lyrics encourage us to count our blessings and reflect on reasons why we worship God. In the realm of children's ministry, this theme underscores the importance of acknowledging the positive transformations and the impacts we have on our communities. I've got some questions for you. Do you believe that with God giving comes receiving? Do we hold steadfast belief that amidst all the trials that happen in life, there exists divine purpose? When faced with adversity, do we recognise that God stands by our side? Ultimately, this song directs us towards the eternal endurance of God's love, urging us to continually express gratitude for the opportunities to impart our faith, particularly to the younger generation. And then the third verse, I won't read it to you, it's up there. Um, for me, this 
illuminate our purpose and calling. Emphasizing the centrality of Jesus in our work, he remains the cornerstones of our actions. The song lyrics resonate with a deep sense of that purpose and calling, urging us to worship and to serve. So in the context of children's ministry, it prompts us to contemplate our calling in nurturing and discipling children. That's echoed in 1 Peter when he says, but you are, and I'm talking to you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's you. You are that chosen people. It is imperative that we embrace our calling to be and to do this work, serving as agents for building God's kingdom and ensuring that our children and young people encounter Jesus through the work. Our purpose as children's workers is to facilitate access to Jesus, regardless of age or background. So, as you listen to this song in the future, let it serve as an encouragement to you. Through faithful adherence to God's work, to the gratitude for multiple uh, multitude of blessings, and the focus on purpose and calling, we trust that God is present in our children's ministry, and he'll guide and support and empower us as we strive for that growth and transformation. Now, I appreciate I'm running really late now. So I'm going to rush through the next bit, but it's really important. So I don't want to just not, not, not say it. I'm just going to, very quickly going to talk to you about Alwyn. She was, she is, one of the people who I owe a great de deed of death, uh, debt of gratitude to, because without her, I wouldn't be stood in front of you today. Um, she was the children's worker in the church when I arrived as a 14-year-old. Um, she is the most amazing person. By day, she cleaned a school. And she very much felt like she was an imposter, <laughs> like she didn't have a place. But she was officially the, the most faithful servant I've ever met. She did a children's group. It was rubbish. It was so rubbish because literally all she had is one book and every week she used to churn out the book. Now, her commitment to it was unbelievable. And actually, she hated it. She hated it because she knew it wasn't doing what she wanted it to do. Our priest left, a new priest arrived, and uh, he said to her, what do you want to do? And she's like, give me some money so I can actually do something, will you? He did, and he, and he actually almost instantly went, there's a check, right, off you go, go and buy some resources. She did nothing. <laughs> Not for the first two months anyway, because what she did was she stopped. She hit the ground kneeling. She prayed about where we were at, what we'd achieved, where we wanted to go, and she made a point of holding on to the fact that this wasn't her will, this was God's will she was trying to achieve. She was unbelievable. Six months later, thriving children's ministry. By that I mean, like children were begging to come to church on a Sunday morning. Unbelievable. 20 years later, she sadly passed away. I went to a funeral and I couldn't get parking anywhere near the church. And when I walked through the door, there must have been 300 people like me, my age, bit younger, who she touched through the children's ministry that she'd had. And do you know why? It wasn't because of any of the resources, actually. It was because she wore Jesus on her shoulder. Everywhere she went, she was an absolute faithful steward. In the end, what she achieved was not her will. It wasn't the priest's will. It was God's will. And those children and young people are all better because of the work that she did. And that's you. That's what you're doing every day. So, I'm picking up pace, Sarah, I promise, right? In ever-evolving world, parish communities face the challenges of remaining relevant and engaging, especially when it comes to involving young people. Ultimately, to address the challenge effectively, we are strongly recommending that parishes be intentional. 
You'll have heard that word, Lords. Okay. But what does it mean to be intentional in fostering growth and involving our young people? Well, I want to share four ways. I'll be as fast as I can, I promise. Here we go. First is prayerful support. First and foremost, being intentional means praying for our children and for their workers. This prayer isn't just a routine. It's a heartfelt plea for inspiration in Christ and the joy of togetherness. Through prayer, we seek divine guidance to nurture the children's spiritual journey and to foster a sense of belonging within the, the parish family. If your church doesn't pray for you and your church and your children, tell them to. That's, that's not a like, please, will you? That's a, you have to be praying for this, right, guys? This is really important. The second is resourcing. Intentionality extends to how we resource our work with children. How many of you pay for your own resources? I bet you there's loads done. Loads here, right? Churches and PCCs need to establish a dedicated budget. What it does is it reflects our commitment to providing children and youth workers with the necessary resources to create engaging and meaningful activities. Without those activities, we can't excite the young minds but equally, we can't reinforce the timeless message of Jesus, can we? So invest in resources and we invest in our young people. That's me paraphrasing what I'd written. <laughs> the third is celebrating successes. Every step forward, no matter how small, is worthy of celebration. Intentionality demands that we acknowledge and celebrate the successes of our children and young people. Every milestone, every lesson learned, every skill mastered deserves recognition. By sharing the stories within the parish community, we inspire others to do it, and we reaffirm our commitment to nurturing them. So don't miss out on the opportunity to say, this is what we've learned and this is what we're doing. And the fourth, probably most challenging, is intergenerational evangelism. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Intentionality involves empowering young people to evangelise and bridge the gap between generations. Through their unique pers perspectives and experiences, the children and youth can breathe new life into our parishes. We need to listen to them. We need to engage with them. By encouraging them to share their faith with older generations, we foster a culture of mutual learning and growth. So intergenerational evangelism becomes a powerful tool for strengthening the bonds within our parish communities. So essentially, embracing intentionality is a call to action. Signifying our unwavering commitment to the spiritual well-being of our children and youth. Pray fervently. Resource adequately. Celebrate success. And foster intergenerational connections. And we can affirm their importance and lay the, the foundations for a vibrant community. Ultimately, showing them that they are valued and they are part of what we do. Now, very quickly, just at the end, I just want to give you a flavour as to where we're going as a diocese, um, and it will be very quick. Um, recently, we've been working on an enormous bid, um, and it's going into the National Church. It's for about, uh, just a tiny figure, about 30 million quid. And what we want, ultimately, is a number of investments across the diocese. One is in um, looking after uh, areas where we have diverse communities. One is where there's urban poor. Um, but the biggest part of the bid is around children and youth work. Because we appreciate that what we need to do is we need to continue to grow what is already happening out there in a really intentional way. So... We, the bid, I don't know whether we'll be successful, by the way, I'm just hopeful, will be for 30 paid workers um, over the course of the next seven years, which is a significant investment. 
The idea being that what we want to do is we want to train up a whole squad of people to work alongside Ben and Sarah to get out into communities to help grow children and youth work. Centr based within parishes and working for parishes to show how intentional church work with young people and children makes a significant difference. There's a couple of key themes that go through it. The first is that we need training. Um, and we're working with Emmanuel College on putting together a particular package for training so that a number of our young people's workers can be uh, adequately trained, professionally trained, doing the job that they do. And, it might, and we're hoping that we all, might also find a network of training for those of you who are interested, who are currently doing, but don't want the paid work. So that's a really important part. The second is networking. Events like this are really key, aren't they? Because today you'll have met people who you'll have never met before, potentially. You'll have had a chance to talk to them about what they're doing in their parishes. And guess what? That's how we learn. Almost everything has been tried before. And there's likely be somebody in here who's already tried it. So networking is key. And one of the dangers in children's ministry is that you get isolated because you're out of, out of church when everyone else is worshipping, or you do your group, and actually you don't have the same connections as, as some of the others within the church setting. So we want to give more opportunity for networking, and these paid workers will help to, to support some of that work. And the third is that we want more events, more things like this, but equally more, more days where we can bring our children to it because it's really key that our children see that they're part of a much, 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 much bigger thing. And that's really scary to quite a lot of parishes who don't want to take their young people out in case they go somewhere else. But remember, this isn't a competition. This is about discipling children. This is about giving them the opportunity to see other, pe other children worship and to grow together. So our hope is that the bid helps every parish. Clearly, not every parish will get a, pa a paid worker, but actually the work and the ripple effect and the support will hopefully reach right across the diocese and support everybody doing what they're doing. The reason I wanted to share that with you is just to share just how intentional we are being in the diocese, how much we cannot sit, we cannot undermine how much we value what you are doing in your places. Without reaching out to these children, without giving them the opportunity to meet Jesus, we might as well give up. And that is absolutely the opposite of what we're trying to achieve here in Blackburn. So when you go back to your parishes, a couple of things. First of all, make sure you feed your own faith. Absolutely key. Secondly, talk to your PCCs and your priests about being intentional in their work if they're not already. Because without that intentionality, we will see no success. And ultimately, keep doing what you're doing. You are doing God's work and we are truly grateful for that. Thank you um, for what you do and for everything that you uh, have done in children's lives up and, up and down and left to right across Lancashire. Keep going.